Thank you, Josh, and thank you to the Center for Free Enterprise for the invitation to speak to you today. Um, you know, I always feel bad about initial applause because you don't know what you're going to get in the subsequent performance, and by the end of it, you may feel so bad about it you wish you could take it back, and yet you can't. So I, I'm going to try to live up to the, to the applause that you gave me beforehand. Um, I, I want to do three things today. The title of my talk is Adventures in the Market for Values, but I want to do three things. The first thing that I want to do is I want to try to situate I want to try to situate what it is that I'm going to tell you within a larger set of concerns that business ethics is concerned or I think should be concerned with. Right. So the first thing I want to do is situate it. The second thing that I want to do, but the title of my talk, is Adventures in the Market for Values. And so the question is, what is the market for values? So I'm going to try to characterize this thing that I am calling the market for values. The third thing that I am going to do is I am going to tell you why I think we should not be disposed to enter the market for values. The market for values is a certain type of phenomenon. It exists out in the world. However, we have a choice whether or not, we have a choice whether or not, we like that? Good. Okay, we have a choice whether or not to participate in the market for values, and I want to suggest that there are good reasons for us to be ill disposed to participate in it. So first, first, by way of situating my concern about the market for values. The prevailing idea of the way business ethics or the prevailing idea of the way the corp corporate social responsibility should not be done is this. The idea is that people in society have expectations, they have values, uh, they have ways that they think business should be done. And the thought is that a socially responsible business, the thought is that an ethical business person is someone who conforms or is a firm that conforms its activities to what it is that society expects. So the idea is that society is a kind of independent variable and business, if it is ethical, right, acts as the dependent variable that, cor that conforms its activities to the expectations of society. I want to suggest that that is one important avenue. Uh, by which to try to understand what, what ethical business looks like. However, I want to suggest that it's not the only one and that it may not be the most important one. That in fact, what we may be, what, what perhaps we should be more concerned with is whether or not people are conforming, whether or not people are conforming to what it is that business expects of them. Why would I say such a thing? Doesn't such a thing run counter to business ethics or to corporate social responsibility? I think not. With the fall of the Berlin Wall, there has been, there has been at least amongst mainstream thinkers, a kind of consensus that has emerged. The consensus is that commercial societies, by which I mean societies in which the principal means by which we acquire the things that we use to make our lives, that commercial societies are the most successful societies on the planet and that they have no real competitors in the world. If that is true, if commercial societies are the most successful societies, if they make people, ha people happier and wealthier and more fulfilled than do other sorts of societies, an important question emerges. The question is this, what sorts of habits and what sorts of dispositions do we as participants in commercial societies have to cultivate so that we may flourish so that we may thrive in commercial societies. That is the broad project within which I want to situate my remarks today. Now, I can't answer that question within 35 minutes. I probably could not answer that question within 35 years. However, what I want to do is give one piece, what I take to be one piece of the puzzle that seeks to answer this question. What kinds of people do we have to be in order to be fit participants in commercial society. What habits and what dispositions do we as human beings who participate in a commercial society have to cultivate so that we may, may flourish, so that we may thrive, so that we may be successful in it? Secondly, what is the market for values? 
In order to understand what the market for values is, we need to understand what I will call a canonical market transaction, or what I will then, well, perhaps more simply call an ordinary market transaction. These are the sorts of market transactions that take place in most cases most of the time. So if we understand what ordinary market transactions look like, perhaps by way of comparison to those, we will understand what makes the market for values interesting and different. In a canonical market transaction, we need three things in order to consummate a transaction between a buyer and a seller. One thing is an agreement on the product over which the transaction is going to take place. The second thing is the price at which the buyer will purchase and the seller will relinquish the good. Right? The third thing that is needed right, is what I will call basic commercial integrity. The buyer must be convinced that the seller and the seller must be convinced that the buyer will, will deliver what is promised. If we, have, if we have an agreement over price, if we have an agreement over product, and if we have an agreement that there exists basic commercial integrity between us, in, in ordinary circumstances, that is when a mutually beneficial transaction will occur. We enter the market for values, however, when price, product, and basic commercial integrity are not enough to consummate a transaction. Uh, let me give you an example. Your pen is lovely. I, I love pens. I, I absolutely adore pens. Actually, I collect fountain pens. I, I own about 80 of them. I have thousands of dollars wrapped up in fountain pens. Most people think I'm nuts for that, right? Except other fountain pen collectors. Right, who love to wheel and deal with me. But your pen is lovely. How much? Can, can I buy your pen from you? How much? Give me, give, give, me, give me a price. At what price would you sell that pen to me? Two dollars. <laughs> really? You'd give that to me for two? That sounds good. That is a lovely pen. You'd give it to me for two dollars. Hmm. Hmm. But do you have basic commercial integrity? Wait, don't tell me I'm going to look up your feedback on eBay and see if you deliver what you promise. Lo and behold, you're a straight shooter. You deliver what you promise, right? You deliver what you promise. However, 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 I, I have one more question. I have one more question before I will agree to transact with you over that pen. I'm really concerned I'm really concerned about whether or not you share my values over something that is very important to me. Right? So, so I'm going to ask you a question about whether or not you share my values over something. Where do you stand, where do you stand on Quebec secession? Right? Quebec is a province in Canada, some of the members of which wish to secede from Canada so that they can make Quebec an independent country. Do you favor Quebec secession or are you opposed to it? <laughs> See, I've never even thought about Quebec secession until this moment. So, so just, just, just choose one. Just choose one. In favor or opposed to Quebec secession? No pressure. A $2 pen transaction rides on it. Favor. Favor. Wrong answer. Wrong answer. I oppose Quebec secession. I will not transact with you. Although you have a product I want, although you are offering a price that I am willing to pay, although I am convinced that you have basic uh, commercial integrity and you can look up my eBay feedback, I have it too, right? I am not willing to transact with you. Why? Because you do not share my values with respect to Quebec secession. I have just entered the market for values. In the market for values, price, product, and commercial integrity are not enough to consummate a transaction. In the market for values, we demand that other people, the people we trade with, our trading partners, share our values. And so we have seen over the last couple of years a flowering of the market for values. Think, for example, of the recent flap over Chick-fil-A. Right? Chick-fil-A's CEO, Dan Cathy, says we at Chick-fil-A believe in the traditional family. Right? Chick-fil-A's uh, corporate philanthropy arm gives money to the Family Research Council. When this comes out, what happens? Some people, people who favor same-sex marriage, for example, right, 
start boycotting Chick-fil-A. On Friday, they were happy to purchase Chick-fil-A sandwiches. They liked the product, they liked the price, they trusted Chick-fil-A to have basic commercial integrity. All of those things are still present on Monday, but we learn that the CEO and the company's corporate philanthropy arm does not share the values of these people. And so they, on Monday, they will no longer purchase Chick-fil-A sandwiches. These are people who are entering the market for values. SodaStream. SodaStream is a company that sells CO2 cartridges that turn plain still water into carbonated water. They're supposed to be quite a bit better than the ordinary ones that you purchase. Um, however, a lot of people are very upset at SodaStream because one of SodaStream's manufacturing plants is located in the disputed West Bank. It's part of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And because SodaStream has set up operations in the disputed territory and is an Israeli company, some people counsel, uh, some people counsel boycotting SodaStream. Again, the problem is not pro product. The problem is not price. The problem is not basic commercial integrity. The problem is that the values of the people who run SodaStream are not the same as those who wish to boycott them. Lastly, Lastly, I need to tell you a story about this man. This man is my great-grandfather, Everett Michel Marcou. Everett and his young wife moved from Saint-Jean-de-Bosset, Quebec. There's Quebec again. Right? Everything fits together, doesn't it? See, you were wondering where I was headed with that. I wasn't just going to let that one go. Um, right. Everett moved with his young bride from Saint-Jean-de-Bossé, Quebec, to uh, a small town in northern Maine to set up a butcher shop, right? And he made a rollicking success of this butcher shop in this small, mostly Francophone, mostly Roman Catholic northern Maine town. However, a couple of years after establishing his, his butcher shop as a success, his wife contracted tuberculosis and died. After a suitable period of mourning, Everett took up with a woman named Stella Eaton, and after a short courtship, he married her. Stella Eaton was a Methodist. Everett married outside the Roman Catholic Church, and what he found was that customers who were happy to buy meat from him on Friday were no longer willing to buy meat from him on Monday. Their problem was not the meat. His meat was just as good on Monday as it had been on Friday. Their problem was not the price. His prices were the same on Monday as they were on Friday. Their problem with Everett was not was not that he lacked basic commercial integrity. No one was saying he puts his thumb on the scales when he weighs up the meat. Instead, they said Everett married outside our church. He does not share our values. We will not do business with him anymore. This is actually a butcher shop he opened many years later on the West Coast. Uh, so he, he, did, he did recover from this close personal encounter with the market for values. Now, right about now, you're saying, Professor Marcou, you're annoying me because you're giving this big fancy name, market for values, for what is really something that we've talked about for a long time, boycott. And so what you're really, what you're really doing is you're, just, you're pouring the old wine of boycotting and the ethics thereof into the fancy new bottle of the market for values uh, only as, as, as an effort to self-aggrandize. And I say that is not correct. Although boycotting is an example of entering the market for values, not all examples of entering the market for values are examples of boycotting. Think again of Chick-fil-A. Right? Chick-fil-A, not long after the boycott of Chick-fil-A got started, held a Chick-fil-A Appreciation Day. And one of the things that appeared in news accounts about Chick-fil-A Appreciation Day were people who went to Chick-fil-A Appreciation Day, who bought chicken sandwiches at Chick-fil-A, who said things to reporters like the following. They said, I don't even like Chick-fil-A, but I'm so glad that Dan Cathy, and I'm so glad that the company shares my values, I'm going to, or I'm going to order and eat Chick-fil-A food. I like to imagine them not liking Chick-fil-A food and holding their noses as they eat the sandwiches. But whether they did it that way or not, they too are entrants in the market for values. Here they're saying, although product, although price, although perhaps commercial integrity are not present, I will purchase from you anyway. Why? Because you share my values. This too is an example of entering the market for values. 
One of the first things that got me thinking about the market for values is, is something called buyblue.org. In the wake of the 2004 presidential election, a hotly contested tilt between George W. Bush and John Kerry that came down to, to a vote count in Ohio, an awful lot of progressive Americans were very disgruntled and were very distraught about the outcome of the election. They were angry and they wanted to punish someone. And a few of them came together and they created a website called Buy Blue. What Buy Blue did is it, is it gathered and it collated uh, campaign finance, publicly available campaign finance uh, uh, information, so that it would be easy for progressives to determine which companies had contributed to political action committees that had favored the Republicans, which ones had contributed to political action committees that had favored the Democrats, and the same for the top officers in the company. The idea was that progressives were supposed to avoid those companies and their products that, uh, that had supported Bush or had supported the Republicans in the election, and were to patronize those who had supported Kerry or those who had supported Democrats in the election. Right? This is interestingly different to me from, from an ordinary boycott, because an ordinary boycott is usually aimed at one particular person or firm for one particular grievance or, or, or issue or concern. Here we are talking about a very diffuse set of grievances and we're also talking about a very diffuse set of firms that are being the object of this sort of, of, this sort of action. So again, wide swaths of the business community were being ruled outside the realm of commerce or alternatively within the realm of commerce based upon sharing values with others. Perhaps the worst thing for buyblue.com, as you'll note, it only lasted for three years before it collapsed, <clears throat> is that buyblue.com was in effect before its time. It was before its time because the era of the ubiquitous smartphone had not yet begun. And so today, we don't have buyblue, but we have buycott. There is an app for that. Bycott allows you to identify any cause that you are concerned with and runs your concerns through a database and indicates the purchase of which products will tend to undermine that cause and which product will tend to support it. Right? Bycott is not sectarian and it is not, uh, it is not partisan. And so, for example, one of the things that Bycott does is it allows you to define your own causes. So, there are causes on Bycott like Boycott Israel. If you want to boycott Israel, they'll tell you how to do it through products. But there's also Support Israel. And if you want to support Israel, they'll tell you how to do it. But Bycott is carrying on, in an important way, the work of buyblue.com. Just so you know, conservatives get around to doing what the, what the buy blue liberals did too. And so we have second vote. And I think second vote is interesting here because of what it says, what it says as its tagline on the website. Your vote counts beyond the ballot. The idea is, the idea is that we are supposed to carry on politics by other means within the market. And so second vote gives you a means by which to support conservative causes and candidates through your purchases and to avoid supporting progressive causes and candidates through your purchases. Right? Again, what is interesting here to me is that there is a difference at least, if not in kind, at least in degree with ordinary boycotts. Why? Because we're targeting, well, we're not targeting at all. We're hitting wide swaths of the business community with a myriad of complaints rather than one person or one firm with one complaint. All of these things are examples of entering the market for values. All right, so far, all I have told you is what the market for values is. I have not given you any reason why you should support it. I have not said anything normative, anything ought-like at all about the market for values. That's where the next part comes in. What I want to say is that we, as per we, if we are to be fit participants in commercial societies, we ought not to be disposed to enter the market for values. Now, please understand what I am and what I am not saying. First, what I am not saying. 
I am not saying that it is wrong to enter the market for values. I'm not saying that it is wrong to refuse to trade with someone because that someone does not share your values. It can't be wrong. It can't be wrong. The failure to give your business to someone is not a violation of any right that person has. No one has a right to your business. Similarly, your failure to transact with someone right, cannot, be a, cannot be a violation of any pre-existing duty you have to transact with someone. You have no duty to transact with anyone in particular. Therefore, it can't be wrong for you to fail to transact with anyone in particular. So I am not claiming that actions of the type enter the market for values are wrong. Right? What I am claiming, what I am claiming is that we ought not to develop the habit or the disposition of viewing our market transactions as opportunities to punish those who do not share our values or as opportunities to reward those who do. And so in other words, what I am giving is what is called a virtue ethics argument. Virtues are habits or dispositions that tend to lead to flourishing lives. Vices are habits or dispositions that tend to retard flourishing or to harm, hum or to harm flourishing human lives. Right? And so the idea is that we ought to do things habitually in the marketplace that tend to promote human flourishing and we ought to avoid habitually in the marketplace things that tend to retard human flourishing. So the question then is, why would developing the habit or the disposition of viewing market transactions as opportunities to punish those who do not share your values or to reward those who do share your values, why would this, why would this be a bad propensity to develop? Individually speaking, it would be a bad propensity to develop because it is imprudent. It is imprudent because you are antecedently, you are antecedently diminishing your circle of potential trading partners. The thought is that for whatever project, for whatever aim, for whatever undertaking uh, you are engaged in, right, there are products that best fit, that best allow you to reach your goals, your ends, or your aims for undertaking that project. If you needlessly limit your circle of potential trading partners, in at least some cases some of the time, if not many cases much of the time, you will end up purchasing, you'll end up purchasing a substandard, or what, or what I really mean is suboptimal products for achieving your purposes. In fact, when, in, when thinking about the market for values, I, was, I, I thought first of Anthony Trollope's novel, Barchester Towers. In Barchester Towers, we learn of a Mrs. Proudy. Mrs. Proudy is staunch to her party and to her church. She prefers to buy bad tea from a, from a low church grocer to purchasing good tea from a grocer who goes to the ritualistic church or to no church at all. Now the problem here is not that Mrs. Proudy wants to support her church. She should support her church. Supporting her church is a good way to do it, is a good thing to do. But supporting her church by, bringing, by drinking bad tea is both a lousy way to support her church and a lousy way to pursue whatever projects that she has that involve tea drinking or, heaven forbid, serving tea to others. I mean, can you imagine serving to someone bad tea and as they make a face say, oh, but it came from someone who goes to our church. What a relief as you're making faces drinking bad tea. Tea, right? The thought is here that this is an imprudent activity. Right? This is not the sort of activity that you would want a person who has projects that they are trying to achieve to engage in. Why? Because their, their projects will go less well, their lives will flourish less well as a result of doing this, particularly if they do it habitually. Right? If we look at our evolved commercial practice, one of the things that we find is that people who are skilled in the practice of business do not seek a gratuitous, by which I mean do not seek an unnecessary like-mindedness. Right? You never see a salesperson, say at a car dealership or what have you, wearing a political button. Why not? Why don't car salespeople wear political buttons? 
I mean, come on, there are people who are, who are politically active like anyone else. Why don't they wear political buttons? Who knows? Why not? I'm sorry? It's bad business. It's bad business. And why is it bad business? Because you're completely taking out half of your potential clients. Yes, yes. In, in politically divisive times, right, you're essentially saying to half the people, I'm your enemy. Let's make a deal. <laughs> right? That's not anything that you want to do. And of course, you know, I noticed this, I noticed this in Chicago. I, I, I noticed this in Chicago with respect to baseball, right? No salesperson will pretend to any interest in baseball whatsoever in Chicago unless they see you coming in wearing a Cubs hat or a Sox hat. And if you're wearing a Sox hat, they will claim to be Sox fans too. Similarly, if you're wearing a Cubs hat, they'll claim to be Cubs fans. The idea is we don't go looking for gratuitous like-mindedness in market transactions. Similarly, think about the practice of keeping secret or being actively deceptive about your reservation price in negotiations, right? One of the reasons why we do this, of course, is that we are, we are as negotiators, advantage seekers. But another reason why we do this is because we may come to an impasse in negotiations if we're truthful with one another about our reservation prices and we disagree about what fairness or about what justice demands. Rather than invite that sort of disagreement, we try to make ourselves inscrutable to one another so that finally when I offer you a price or she offers me a price like $2, I have to ask, look, I don't know whether you're getting a great deal out of selling that for $2 or just enough to make it worthwhile, but I know $2 is too good a deal for me, is too good a deal for me to pass up. That's why I'm interested in the transaction. Right? So the idea is that our evolved commercial practice tells us that we should not go seeking like-mindedness that we don't need in order to accomplish mutually beneficial transactions. So if my worry is that individuals who habitually enter the market for values will be imprudent, my greater concern is for what it does to the social order. For I want to contend that if entering the market for values habitually becomes widespread in a community, this will tend to be socially divisive. Right? It, that is, if we enter the market for values habitually, seeking only to do business with Democrats or Republicans, only to do business with Catholics or with Protestants, only to do business with vegetarians or non-vegetarians, Right? We are going to fracture and factionalize not just the market, but we are going to fracture and factionalize the community that we share. And I think that is actually the bigger problem. Right? Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, he's the head rabbi for Great Britain. When I found this quote, I, I, just, I just thought it was tremendous. Right? Rabbi Sachs says that in exchange, difference difference between people becomes a blessing and not a curse. In all other forms of social cooperation, we need to agree upon a lot in order to be able to cooperate. But market transactions are interestingly different. The mar a market transaction is social cooperation in atomic form. A market transaction is social cooperation on minimal terms. right? It's minimal because a market transaction can be entered into by the smallest number of people necessary to make something social. That would be two. And a market transaction can be effectuated over matters as large or as minute as the people participating in it care to. But when we start adding gratuitous like-mindedness to this, we tear at the fabric of community. We tear at the fabric of community because when you say to another person, you are not an eligible trading partner, I claim that what you are really saying is you are not eligible to be in my community. Because if we cannot trade with one another, if we cannot view one another as at least potential trading partners in everything that we undertake, we can't cooperate on anything bigger. Because anything bigger will require even more like-mindedness than a market transaction will. And so, one of the great virtues of liberal societies, and in fact a virtue that is necessary to practice in order for a liberal society to, maintain, to remain a liberal society, 
And by a liberal society, I mean a society in which liberty is the primary political value. Right. A necessary virtue for the people of a liberal society to practice is toleration. Toleration does not mean liking what others dislike. That's the way it is often used in today's vernacular. What toleration really means is putting up with that which you don't like. So saying, for example, I don't agree with your religion. I don't agree with your values. I don't agree with your baseball team, right? But I will coexist with you anyway, right? A liberal society demands toleration amongst its citizens and amongst its participants in order to survive. But entering the market for values is a profound form of intolerance. Let's see, what, is, what else is it that I want to say? Right. Philip Wicksteed, a late 19th and early 20th century economist and theologian, described the appropriate attitude to market transactions. He used a term called non-tuism to describe it. The idea of non-tuism is this, that in transacting with you, in transacting with you, I am not aiming to advance or to retard your interests in any particular way. In fact, I'm interested in your interests over the pen only in so far as they help me effectuate a transaction. And that's your attitude toward me too. You're not trying to enhance my well-being, neither are you trying to harm my well-being. You're just interested enough in my well-being to pursue it enough so that we can effectuate a transaction on terms we can agree on. What am I trying to say with this? What I'm trying to say is that non-tuism, which I take to be an attitude very close to not having a disposition to enter the market for values, is liberal toleration in its commercial form. We practice liberal toleration politically when we agree to coexist with people and practices that we disagree with. We practice liberal toleration economically when we go to the Chick-fil-A and we say, I'll take two chicken sandwiches, and by the way, I think your CEO is wrong about that. So the basic, the basic idea, the basic idea is, is that that we should be quite willing, we should be quite willing to, well, wh wh what is the old saying uh, in American English, right? To agree to disagree, but to still coexist. But to still coexist. So am I opposed to people registering their disagreements with one another? No, that is something that you should do. That is something that you should do at the ballot box. That is something that you should do through open and vigorous debate. That is something that you should do with posts on Facebook. That is something that you, you should do by writing letters to the editor of newspapers if anyone actually does that anymore. Right? These are all things that I think we should do. The problem is not registering disagreement or expressing our values. The problem is using those values as a way to try to threaten others' livelihoods. When we use our values to try to threaten others' livelihoods, we not only make ourselves poorer, which is bad enough, I think, but we make our communities less cohesive. It's a dangerous game to try to break the economy and the society into, into blue and red, into Catholic and Protestant, into vegetarian and non. We cannot long remain a community if we do that. The right attitude to bring to the marketplace is not Mrs. Prudy's. Instead, we should bring Charles Barkley's attitude to the marketplace. Charles Barkley, the NBA Hall of Fame basketball player, the round mound of rebound, as he was known, was once asked after he left the Philadelphia 76ers, he was once asked, would you ever return to the Philadelphia 76ers? And this is what he said in response. He said, I can be bought. If they paid me enough, I'd work for the Klan. Now, of course, Barkley said this. Barkley said this in order to be shocking. But beneath the shocking idea sits the liberal, sits the tolerant, sits the non-tuistic ethos. For here is what Barclay has said. Barclay has said, I can imagine cooperating on projects with people whose interests are not only divergent from my own, but are actually conflicting with mine, so long as our interests touch at a point. 
as it is for Charles Barkley, so habitually should it be for the rest of us. Now, am I saying never enter the market for values? No. I want to analogize it to something that a number of you in this room, I, I imagine, might care about very deeply. <coughs> Drinking to excess. Right? If you drink to excess on your birthday and on Super Bowl Sunday, but otherwise do not, you do not have a drinking problem. But if your occasion for drinking to excess is that it is a day whose name ends in Y, you have a drinking problem. The same goes for the market for values. I am not saying that there is no cause. I am not saying that there is no issue for which, for which you should ever enter the market for values and refuse to trade with some. Right, or, or choose to trade with others. What I am saying is that you should do it temperately. You should do it judiciously. You should do it the same way you drink to excess. Right, or the same way you should drink to excess. That only by doing it that way can we maintain a commercial society and only by doing it that way can we thrive within a commercial society. Thank you. <laughs>